Well, good morning, everybody. This is Kareem Taufik again. Uh, we are in the Temporal Bone Lab at uh, Vanderbilt, and we are going to go ahead and start the live dissection portion of the course. Of the course, I want to thank all of our panelists. We uh, currently have Dr. Brandon Isaacson on from UT Southwestern. Um, you've already heard uh, a great talk from Brandon. Justin Golub is on as well. He also gave a couple of great lectures this morning. Uh, thank you guys both for joining us. Um, Happy to be here. Thanks, Justin. Uh, so we uh, are hoping to be joined shortly by Dr. Rivas, Alejandro Rivas from uh, Case Western, as well as Dan Lee from Mass Ioneer. Um, they should be joining us shortly. But uh, what I'm holding in my hands here, I'll go ahead and start talking to you about some of the equipment that we like to use in the operating room when we're doing endoscopic ear surgery. So right now I'm holding a Stortz endoscope with a Stortz camera. This is a zero degree Hopkins rod, a 14 centimeter scope. And this is a three millimeter diameter scope. This is the workhorse of uh, the tool for visualization that we use during endoscopic ear surgery. Um, so what you're seeing, what you should be seeing now is the feed from the Stortz camera. Um, and I'm now showing you a view of a cadaveric temporal bone. This is a right eardrum um, with, I'll take a Rosen from you, Liz. I have Liz here to my right. She's our second year fellow who's graciously offered to help out with the uh, with scrubbing this uh, dissection. So on the tip of my Rosen is a hair, but what, not, what I'm going to do now, after having gotten that uh, rosin cleaned off, is show you the malleus. This is the lateral process of the malleus. This is the umbo, and this is the handle of the manubrium, the long process of the malleus. So here's the pars flaccida, and here's the pars tensa of the eardrum. This is anterior. This is posterior. This is superior, and this is inferior. So. You've heard our lecturers talk repeatedly this morning about the fact that an endoscopic view um, offers you a much wider angle of view than the, than the microscope traditionally offers. Also with the microscope, you know, we're typically looking down the barrel of the ear canal like so. Um, and we have to contend with things like the anterior canal bulge, which, is, which I'm showing you here. You can see that with the endoscope, what I can do is position my left hand in a way that shows me the entire, um, the entire tympanic ring. I can see the anterior annulus very clearly, whereas with the microscope, we often have to kind of fight to get there. Sometimes we have to take down the anterior canal skin and drill a canal plasty, widen the bony canal so that we can get that view of the anterior annulus. Um, the other things that I wanna point out to you are some, some uh, issues of ergonomics. So, Personally, and I, everybody's a little bit different with this, but uh, I tend to use my thumb to, and tell me if you can see my, my hand position okay. Um, I like to use my thumb to support the base of the camera. Um, and, and I like to use my fingers, my first and, or my second and third finger wrapped around the, the light cord um, and my, my uh, fourth and fifth for stability. Um, some people like to kind of, hold it like, like this instead, and that's fine too. It's whatever's most comfortable. I find that having the tip of my thumb against the base of the, of the camera is, is most comfortable, but you know, if I'm getting fatigued from that um, during the case, I'll, I'll often uh, switch to that second position uh, to give my, my thumb muscles a break. Um, I will say that if you're doing this technique for the first and second and third and even the 10th time and you're you're not doing it frequently enough to build up the muscles of the non-dominant hand. It is, it is uh, you'll notice that you, you do fatigue. And I remember that, um, that when I first, the first several times I used this technique, I'd wake up the following morning with some pain in, in the muscles of my hand. That doesn't happen much anymore, fortunately. And, um, but it is something that our, our trainees have to contend with, especially after the first several times they, they've done this. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift up a flap with the uh, zero degree endoscope and show you what that's like, show you some of the different endoscopic ear instruments that we use that are special to this technique. And then at some point, we'll show you uh, the Calibri, which is uh, uh, you've heard about a couple of times during the lectures this morning. And that's a, that's a novel disposable endoscope with an incorporated suction um, that 
sort of um, allows us to use more of a two-handed dissection uh, during endoscopic ear surgery. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Liz. Kareem, I have a quick question. This is Daniel Lee from Boston. How are you? Hi, Dan. Thank you for joining us. No, thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation for spearheading what looks like to be a really fantastic uh, agenda of talks. Can you comment on the opposite post issue when you're using an angled telescope? Because sometimes the optical cord, uh, the way it uh, arises from the Hopkins rod can sometimes bump into the shoulder, depending on what angle you want to see. Yeah, that's a great point. Can you provide some uh, tips or comments on that for the viewers? Yeah, are you talking about uh, the opposite cord issue with an angled endoscope? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So the, the Stortz does make um, uh, two different variations of angled endoscopes, one with the, with the cord projecting um, ipsilla or on the same side as the, as the bevel of the, uh, of the end of the telescope, and another with the opposite. And what do you like to do, Dan? What, which do you prefer? I just use it as they hand it to me, which is the post is opposite the angle of the lens. And so okay. you look opposite to where the optical cord is coming from, which is fine depending on which ear you're operating on. But as you know, with, for example, a patient and you're doing a, a right ear and the patient has no neck and big shoulders, that optical cord can sometimes bump into the shoulder. And so you can sometimes have to compromise on your view just because you're dealing with the the issues of the equipment. And so that's why it's good that Stortza has, has another option for those who encounter that uh, problem commonly. Absolutely. And, and uh, I want to tell the panelists, that please, I'm, I'm going to go ahead with this dissection, but please feel free to chime in. Please tell me, you know, if you see me doing something different from what you're doing or that you, that you feel uh, is, uh, is a better technique or a more efficient technique, I, you know, I, I would love to learn from you and I would love for our uh, audience to learn from you guys as well. Liz, so, I'll take a, a couple of comments. Um, for flap, elevate, flap incisions and elevation, I think it's yeah. really key to kind of make that determination before you make your flap incisions, depending on what your pathology is. So, you know, for, for a stapedectomy, you know, I kind of like a standard, you know, kind of anteriorly based tamponado flap or maybe almost, almost anterior inferiorly based. So I don't need to elevate as much inferior canal skin with the stapes operation or like a posterior superior perforation. So I will kind of make my anterior canal incision kind of more on the anterior superior canal. And I'll make my post, my, my inferior canal incision, you know, the six o'clock incision will actually be kind of more like what you've done with your inferior incision here. So this is kind of more of a, kind of an anterior inferiorly based template of flap. In other words, the, the horizontal portion or the lateral portion of your incision is kind of on the posterior superior canal instead of just centered on the posterior canal. So, and again, if I have an inferior perforation, then I'm gonna kind of rotate my flap incisions more inferiorly or in this ear, in a right ear, I'd rotate it more um, counterclockwise. Um, it's hard to kind of articulate that without a picture or a diagram, but, um, so I think just take some time to think about how you make your canal incisions, depending on what, what the, where your pathology is at. So that makes, that can make a big difference and make your life a lot easier. Whenever I do stapes, yeah, a, no, sorry, go, go ahead, Baron. I'm sorry. Go, keep right. going. And whenever I do stapes operations, I always make sure I make that an, that anterior or superior canal incision. I always make it at least a couple of millimeters anterior to the lateral process of the malleus. And the reason for that is if you run into a situation where you have, malleus fixation, you may, you will likely need to do a, some type of adicotomy in order to address that. And so if you make your incision just lateral to, or lateral to and superior to the lateral process, you're going to have a harder time opening up the, the scutum because some of the canal skin is still going to be in the way. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, uh, Brandon, I noticed that during your talk on uh, endoscopic stapedectomy, you, you like to, uh, I'll, I'll take a rose and list so I can point this out. Um, it looked to me like you, uh, you like to make your stapedectomy flap incision about here at around 12 o'clock and another incision about here coming out uh, several millimeters lateral to the fibrous annulus and then connecting the dots. Is that correct?
Kareem, while he's mulling over that response, <laughs> a more general comment about obviously you're doing a very beautiful prosection here in the lab. It's a cadaveric specimen. There's no secretion or fluid issue yeah. to your dress. You're not using a suction elevator. The one that you made, by the way, right? <laughs> well, it was a team effort. A lot of my residents provided unbelievably valuable feedback to uh, end up with, with this design. But there are many great uh, instruments out there. Um, and this is just one small example of it. But the um, just generally, could you comment on, even before doing the flap elevation, how do you prepare the ear in terms of prepping the ear? Do you have a conversation with anesthesia about the blood pressure that you ideally want to, to reach? Because I think that the most common reason a lot of our participants return to our courses is because they're frustrated because they do a few of these cases and they encounter bleeding and they stop. And so this is potentially the one thing that if they can overcome the challenge of flap elevation, the rest of it, um, it becomes a little bit more uh, straightforward in terms of learning curve. Oh, that's a great point. I, for me personally, I, I, uh, I always make sure to get a really good flat uh, injection before we get started. I think that is that makes the rest of the case go much, much more smoothly. Sometimes there are situations that we, you know, where you where you're never going to get it perfect if it's an acutely inflamed ear, a chronically inflamed ear, a very hyperemic skin. You know, you're still going to try your best to get a good injection, but it's it's a more difficult to do that than say a you know, a, a, a normal non-inflamed ear, such as with a stapes uh, operation. But, um, and your point about speaking with anesthesia and maintaining a good blood pressure control, you know, ideally, you know, we try to have MAP around 100 or so, and uh, assuming that it's a normal tensive patient to begin with. Um, what about you, Dan and Justin? I think, I think it's all about the anesthesia um, in the end. Injection's clearly important. Positioning the patient so that they're somewhat reversed Trendelenburg, if that's felt to be safe for the patient in terms of uh, perfusion issues. But um, it's all about anesthesia. I can I can uh, monitor the systolic pressure just by how much oozing is in the ear. I, I don't even have to look at the monitor. And so I think if you can achieve controlled, safe hypotension with a relatively healthy patient, that is extremely important. If you cannot, then I think you're going to struggle no matter how much injection you use and how many fancy suction instruments that you work with. If I can chime in, I do completely agree with the sentiment that bleeding is a, a frustration in the beginning and it's often the chief discourager from continuing with this technique. Um, so um, certain tools can really help. So first of all, Dan Lee's suction round knife is my favorite tool. That is very helpful when raising the tympanometal flap, which is both often the bloodiest step Mine and also too, by the way. early yeah. step. You don't, you don't use the Vanderbilt uh, elevator, you use the Boston elevator. Uh, no offense good. to Dr. Rivas. I still, <laughs> I still do use, uh, I like to use the Rivas. Why don't we show that real quick, Liz, the 45 degrees suction elevator. Um, so I, I like to use um, the uh, D Dan Lee's suction round knife, which I was just using for the majority of that flap elevation. Um, that's, that's sort of my go-to for, for, um, for flap elevation. If I've, gotten a really good injection and uh, there's not much bleeding during the flap elevation. I, I love a McCabe round knife, or I'm sorry, McCabe flap knife. Um, it's a double-ended instrument. We'll, just, we'll show that again here in a moment. But first I wanna show you that Rivas 45 degree suction elevator, which, and the, the, the um, before we got Dan Lee's suction round knife here, this was my primary tool for TM flap elevation. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, you know, it's got a little bit of a more aggressive looking end. It's finer. Um, it is also really nice for, you know, that point where you've just exposed the annulus and found the middle ear mucosa and you want to enter the middle ear. I love it because you can get that perfect angle of entry, stay on the bone and go in between the annulus and the, and the uh, bone of the tympanic ring and go ahead and enter the ear. And, you know, the other thing I like about it, you can, the side of it is sharp. You can kind of swipe uh, along the, uh, the tympanic groove and, and further elevate that uh, tympanic annulus. What about that's you guys? Nice tool. Yeah, that is, that is a nice tool. I have not used that, but I would like to. One thing I wanted to mention yeah. is the um, other endoscope that you have sitting uh, yeah. next to your hand. Um, I'm sure you'll demo that later. This newer Calibri novel endoscope has a built-in suction. And that is very, very helpful for bleeding. And the more you use it, the more utility you find in this built-in suction. So for those who aren't familiar, 
this other device has a suction board built into the endoscope. So if you're a right-handed surgeon, you're holding the endoscope with your left hand and using your left thumb, there's a thumb swivel and you can manipulate this curved suction. So you can literally kind of have two hands when using an endoscope, which is, which is really cool. So uh, I wanna kind of point out some, some anatomy that we, we rarely get to see with a microscope. I'll, I'll take a suction real quick, Liz. So again, I, I, right now, all I'm using is a zero degree. Uh, and most likely our, our audience will, if they've uh, been involved in microscopic ear surgery, they can probably get a sense that the angle of view is much wider than you get with an endoscope. Um, right now, I'm staring down, staring uh, at the round window niche. Suction out some of this fluid. There are some hypotympanic air cells there. And uh, Justin, you, you gave a beautiful talk about uh, some, some anatomy. Here's the funiculus. I like to think of that funiculus as the, you know, sort of the anterior pillar of the round window, right? Here's the round window niche. We kind of drilled that away, you'd see that the true round window lives down there. Here's the posterior pillar of the, uh, of the round window. And looks like uh, just above my, I'll take a rose and so I can point that out a little bit better. It looks like that's probably the ponticulus right there. That's the ponticulus there. Yep. Our subiculum is gonna be coming off somewhere back here. You can probably get a better view of that uh, in a few minutes when we put the angled endoscope in. Here's, of course, our stapedial tendon. Here's the stapes capitulum. There's the posterior cruce of the stapes. Our anterior cruce is going to be that way. This is the lenticular process of the incus attached to the long process of the incus. Here's our corda tympani nerve. And you can see that kind of coursing down just medial to the handle of the malleus. That little structure he's lifting up is yeah. the posterior ligament. And it sometimes gets confused with the corda, but it, it actually, it crosses over the corda kind of from posterior superior to anterior inferior and inserts on the, essentially the mid to upper third of the malleus handle. Um, so and you can kind of see where, where it's extending from that Let's get a cure, right? the posterior malleolar spine. And that, that ligament has a fold, which is what you see there. Hey, um, Alejo. Uh, hi, Tofik. How are you doing? I'm good. And so a lot of times that, um, I mean, Probably when you look at, at anatomy pictures, a lot of the description the says, say that the posterior malleolar ligament attaches to the neck of the malleus. But that never happens. It always attaches to the manubrium, and when you have when you have very um, uh, thick inflammatory disease, it can be. And you're trying to elevate the drum off of the handle of the malleus. Sometimes it's difficult to to detach that ligament off of the handle of the malleus. You you need to use a sharp instrument to do that. All right, so what I'm doing now, I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit and show you uh, some of the um, anatomy you can appreciate of the middle ear when you're using an angled scope. So right now I just hooked up a 45 degree. And this is one where the light cord is coming off opposite to the lens. So when you're, you know, just like, what, just like we do with sinus surgery, right? You, you, this is a, if you're using an angle endoscope, you kind of have to uh, force your mind to switch gears and, and think about the angle of entry a little bit differently. Get used to being able to see much of the posterior canal skin as you're kind of driving the, uh, the endoscope through the ear canal. So here's uh, more of the retro tympanic anatomy that there, let me get the rose in. Kareem, as you uh, complete your dissection with the angled scope, could you comment to the participants on uh, safety issues regarding the use of a 30 or especially a 45 degree scope? And um, for beginners, would you recommend starting with an angled scope? Well, yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. So I, I think uh, at the beginning, I, 
it's, uh, it's definitely much easier to start with a zero degree, get comfortable um, with the anatomy that you see with a zero degree, the ergonomics. Um, and then, you know, I do think that it's probably easier for uh, those of us who are closer to having been trained with, uh, you know, to do sinus surgery with endoscopes, uh, to become facile with using angled endoscopes in the ear. Um, I think those skills are pretty transmissible. Don't you agree with that? I, I think in general, I would agree. I would just caution those who are watching that the zero degree provides a beautiful wide angle view. And so I would say more than 90 to 95% of my dissection in any individual case is done with a zero degree endoscope. Yeah. So I really only go to the 30 degree if I'm having some difficulty looking around the corner and a 45 degree, maybe. But I yeah. think starting with a zero degree is the safest way to get started. And I've seen some close calls and one case where a stapes subluxed because the chief was looking one way and the scope was, you know, looking the other way and you don't know right. what the instrument hand is doing. And right. all it takes one little sword play maneuver and bada bing, bada boom. Uh, thankfully, this patient did okay, but had significant tinnitus and dizziness for a couple of weeks post yeah. um, uh, stapes tickling. So um, I just would caution those, start with a zero degree because it already gives you a phenomenal wide angle view. So I just want to take a quick moment. I'll, I'll just point out some, some more uh, retro tympanic anatomy. Here's our pyramidal eminence. We can see that uh, much better with the 45 degree in this case, but you can also see that very clearly if you're curetting the sputum aggressively. I'm choosing not to do, to do much curetting with this temporal bone today because we don't have it fixed on a, on a bowl. But um, uh, here's the bottom edge of the round window. It's kind of obscured in some blood. This is, this is again, probably the subiculum here, the posterior sinus deep to the pyramidal eminence there, the posterior stapedial space. Here's the sinus tympani. And then our subiculum is probably this uh, diminutive spicule here. And that's a variable structure along with the ponticulus. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the things that we learn as we, as we use these angled endoscopes and evaluate the retro tympanum more thoroughly is that the sinus tympani is a really variable space. Its depth, its posterior depth is, is extremely variable and its superior inferior height is variable due to the positions of the, uh, you know, the variability of the positions of the ponticulus and the supiculum. Sometimes you never even see those structures. So I'll just get a little bit of a better view of the epi tympanum now too. A couple of comments. Um, one of the, uh, one question was how to, where to rest your hand uh, or your arm. And you really, you're, uh, Justin had a, a nice answer. And I just want to add, add to that in that um, you're usually going to rest your elbow on something, either the table, or if you have a chair with arms, you, you're going to rest your elbow on that. If it's an adjustable armchair, you're going to want to kind of, before you start your case or you know, you're, or while you're sitting down, you are going to want to adjust that, that arm, the, the, the armchair height up to an appropriate area so your arm your whole arm is not free floating the other thing you're going to do is the side of the endoscope is going to typically rest on one part of your canal depending on where you're looking and so that's going to provide some image stabilization when you're first starting this you're going to be tempted to kind of just free float the scope in the middle of the canal and you're going to get a lot of movement of the image on the screen it's going to make it look really unstable so yeah. again your elbow is going to rest on the patient's bed um, or maybe the patient's uh, shoulder a little bit. You don't want to put too much pressure. Or on the ch if you have one of those adjustable length armchairs, you'll put your arm on that, and then the side of the scope is going to rest against the canal. I would agree with Brandon. Brandon, great and very, very relevant comments. Resting the telescope is a big challenge for a beginning ear endoscopist, and so uh, we we'll totally agree with that. You want to stabilize it along the meatus, especially posteriorly, rather than hovering it. Otherwise, you're going to really have a, um, a very mobile image. And so I, go ahead. One, one more comment. There are some, I think uh, a number of people or like I know the Italian, Italian group, they do a lot of their surgery standing up, which I kind of refuse to do being an otologist. The, one of the benefits is sitting for surgery, but the advantage of standing up and doing surgery is that you're going to have your elbow in your side like you would for a sinus case. And that also provides for image stability. If you're also standing up, you can potentially get more kind of angulation on the scope to look and uh, kind of change your angle of view. It's a little bit more easy to do that way. 
I still would rather just sit, but that's, that's just another option. So I'll just take a quick moment to point out some uh, epitympanic anatomy. There's the head of the malleus. Um, and you see the incudomalleer joint. So this is, you know, you would have to do a, a big atacotomy with a microscope to, if you want, if you were, if you hope to see this anatomy with, with uh, transcanal microscopic technique. You can also um, see the cog there too. Right, yeah. So there's, there's the cog, that kind of ridge coming down from the Tegman tympani. Um, you know, a lot of people consider that the uh, demarcation between the anterior and posterior epitympanic spaces. And then earlier, I'll defog real quick. <laughs> I'll show you some pro-tympanic anatomy. And Kareem, as you show us the pro-tympanum, um, relevant to discussions about where you stabilize your other hand. I know some surgeons, David Pothier, certainly when he was alive, would have a Mayo stand draped to stabilize his uh, left hand and arm during a right ear surgery. Oh, interesting. I've never thought to do that. That's a, that's a nice idea, though. So uh, what we're looking at there in the sort of uh, just top, just soup, just uh, at the top center of the screen, that's, that's what we call the tensor fold. That's a, um, a mucosal fold with um, variability in its development. It can be uh, developed to the point where there's no uh, ventilation, um, uh, meaning no air passage going through the tensor fold. In this case, it looks like there's a, there's a little bit of a, a mi missing mucosa there, which is really not missing. I mean, it's a, it's a normal variation in the tensor fold. Uh, but if you, you know, it's thought that as a lot of people agree with this, that uh, if the tensor fold is, um, is completely developed to the point where you don't have any space there, it's, uh, it places the patient at, at risk of uh, poor ventilation of that anterior epitympanum, especially if, of course, if the, uh, if the posterior isthmus is, is blocked. So um, there's the, the isthmus, uh, which is between that tensor tympani and the incudocepedial joint ventilating the epitympanum. And if I remember correctly, Justin, you lectured about this. This would be called the anterior epitymp epi the anterior isthmus, whereas this would be the posterior isthmus behind the uh, behind the long process. Is that correct? I believe so, but I'll defer to Dr. Rivas as I learned this from reading his his uh, papers and lectures. <laughs> What do you think, Dr. Rivas? Did I get that right? Yeah, so the, the, yes, you got that right. So the anterior isthmus is the communication, that is, is the space, Switch. is the airway passage that goes from the eustachian tube under the malleus and over the incus and is going to be ventilating all the lateral epitympanic space. The posterior isthmus is the airway passage that goes same pathway, but it divides into two. So it goes from on from the eustachian tube under the malleus, under the incus, and at the same time as under the incus, under the the lateral incudomalleal fold, and and the lateral incudomalleal fold is what divides the lateral epitympanic space from the medial epitympanic space. And so that's one of the, the areas that is important and that can be obstructed on this ventilation syndrome, which is a perfectly aerated uh, 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 mesotympanum, but a retracted, retract, retracted epitympanum because the isthmus is closed and typically the tensor fold is also closed. So there's no ventilation pathways into the, into the, into the uh, epitympanum. So that's a, that's a, that was described by, by Livio Persuti and Daniel Marchioni, um, the, the, that, that syndrome, the disventilation syndrome. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit now. Um, what I'm holding in my hands is uh, a device called the Calibri. You've heard about this a few times now in the lectures from this morning. Um, this is a disposable endoscope manufactured by 3NT. Um, it is, 
it's really kind of a wonderful device. I've never used it in surgery. This is my first time using it in any kind of temporal bone, whether it be a cadaver or a live patient. Um, but uh, the beautiful thing about this is that it incorporates a suction and it allows you to uh, sort of return your left hand to more of a normal otologic surgical position. Um, so whereas with the, um, with the endoscope, the way I was holding it was sort of the, the way that you would typically hold a, um, a zero degree uh, for a sinus surgery. Now, now we're sort of returning our left hand to the position in which we would typically hold a suction. Um, so the way this works, um, we, the way you grip this device is you kind of start with an open hand and then, and then put the, uh, the handle, uh, which has this sort of lever in the back to help rest against the uh, back of your hand. Um, and you open up the crook between your thumb and forefinger and, and uh, hold that handle like so. There's a strap um, that's, uh, that's flexible. It's just a, looks like it's probably a rubber strap and you can tighten it around the, the, uh, the tip of your middle finger. So that you wanna tighten it between the tip of the finger and the, uh, and the most distal knuckle. And with that, I can kind of freely rotate the device and use my other fingers for other functions. So the other thing I'll show here is that uh, there's a joystick, if you will, that manipulates this curved suction. Uh, I'm going to take the suction out. All right, there we go. So I'm not sure if you can get a zoomed in view of this or not, but it's a curved suction that's pretty close to what we would use uh, uh, in surgery for like a three French, a three French uh, ear sucker, except it has a curve at the end. And there's this joystick that, um, that has some tubing attached to it. Um, you can, there are two ports here. I'm not sure if you can get a view of this or not, um, but there are yeah, two we can ports. Kind of see. Okay. You can, you can choose to have the suction uh, coming off the lower end of the screen, which I'll show you here in just a second, or the, or the top end of the screen. So it's very easy to kind of put this suction in, take it out. So right now I've chosen to have it on the, on the lower end of the screen. Sorry, somebody was about to say something. I was gonna comment that it clogs a lot less than you would think because it's continually suctioning. So you're less likely to accumulate these big clots that will then clog it. I, in a typical case, I'll, I'll change the suction maybe three or four times compared to using a three French, I'll, change, I'll have to take it out and declog it like 10 times. I see, yeah. So the, the other thing, um, the other thing I'll say is that just like uh, with our with our normal suctions we use in the OR, where they have a thumb port through which you can control the degree of suction, with this it's a little bit different in that you use your forefinger to, uh, against that suction port. So what I'll do now is I'll start the suction. Go into the ear here, and now. I have this retractable suction that I can advance and, and move backward as needed to pick up tissue or put it back. And, you know, the, the extent to which I've used this is really, it's, I've used it uh, a few times on a middle ear trainer. Why don't we get a Bellucci? We'll cut that uh, corda. Karim, can you comment on the uh, viewing angle that you can achieve with yeah. this chip scope? Because we're so used to having a swap from zero to 30 to 45. And this technology does allow for a pretty good wide field view with only one scope. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so what I, what I notice, um, you know, putting this in the ear for the first time is that the angle of view is extremely wide. It looks like it's widest at the corners of the screen. It's a square shaped screen. Whereas with a Stortz endoscope, you have more of a circular view. Um, and uh, Ehud, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the angle of view is 90 degrees from right to left and 100 degrees, uh, 120 degrees from uh, one corner to the diagonal corner. And you can kind of appreciate that looking at this image. So now I, I see the full view of the Mesotympanum, I'm seeing a portion of the epitympanum. Um, 
I see uh, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. I'll take the rose and point this stuff out. So, so it appears that the wide angle view actually improves the closer you bring the scope to the target. Yes. Yeah. So it, that's true. It looks like, uh, whereas with an, a Stortz endoscope, I think our tendency is to hold it farther away um, while we're working so, to give both hands space to, to uh, exist in the ear canal. With this, it's a lower, it's a smaller diameter scope. It's two, is it 2.2 millimeters? 2.2 millimeter diameter. Most of our um, Stortz endoscopes, we use our three millimeters. Does anybody use the 2.7 millimeter uh, Stortz endoscope to do endoscopic ear surgery? Dan, Dr. Rivas, Brandon? I did when I didn't have any, that was all we had. We either had four or 2.7s. Um, yeah. The only length they came in at the time was 18 centimeters. And so uh, the image wasn't quite as good and it was in its higher risk of bending or breaking the endoscope. So I, you know, fortunately now I have uh, access to three millimeters pretty much everywhere I operate. Yeah, yeah. So we lost our suction there. It looks like our suction is a little bit off axis, but uh, let me get the, uh, do you, um, I'll take the right angle hook here in just a second, Liz. Liz has been very gracious in offering to help out with this. You know, one other nice feature I think with this system is that you can change the position of your suction, right? So depending on where you want to dissect uh, and where you want to access, right. you can sort of move that suction around so it's not in the way of your instrument hand. That's a great point. In fact, I think uh, I might try moving that suction to the other side and seeing how that works. Dan, yeah, how, how often are you using this? A great question. We are not using it. We are still in negotiations with our institution and the companies. So, and uh, I, I need to also disclose to the participants that uh, I am a consultant for 3NT and I do have equity in the company. Uh, but that being said, it's still great to have some new technology that's available for use uh, in endoscopic ear surgery. I think the form factor and lightweight design and small diameter with a robust three function, three French suction, I think is a good, a good choice. I used to use 20 French suctions for most of my otology cases, but the three French is just a little bit better because you get better pulling power and it doesn't get clogged quite as often. So, so I, I, it's Justin Gallup here. Oh, we go ahead, Kareem. I can no, after, after you, please. No, go okay. ahead. Yeah, so I, I really like this tool. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. I just am a fan of this tool. I probably used it a, about two dozen times Correct. and um, I'm still getting better and better every time I use it because it's a very, it's a novel thing to be able to suddenly use your left hand for a suction. Novel for an endoscopic ear surgeon, maybe not novel for a microscopic ear surgeon, but for five years, I six years, I haven't really used my left hand to suction and now I can, and it's really liberating. Just to make a brief comment about um, um, having the um, freedom to move around the suction where you want and move it to the opposite port. If you recall, Dr. Tautik was showing there's two ports where you could put the suction below or above and he has it above now. So actually just earlier this week for the first time, I tried moving it to the above port and it really, um, it really changes where you'll suction. So there's a maneuver we do where we take, where we cut the um, eardrum off the malleus, which I always find one of the harder parts in a simple tapanoplasty. And if you move the calibri suction to the top port, it's actually in a great Correct. place to suction on the bleeding malleus as you cut it off, which is an, an incredible time saver. Yeah, so, you know, while Liz is uh, fetching, there we go, the crab tree, I, you know, I'm noticing that I could definitely see how having that suction port on the top after lifting up the flap could be useful because now I see, I just feel like I have a little bit more room to work um, on the back side of the ear canal than I did with the, uh, with the suction port on the back. Okay, cups. Justin, in your experience with this distal chip system, as we all know with one-handed dissection, if you're doing a revision to panoplasty and you're trying to elevate a cervical ear with the cartilage graft, that it's hard to keep that flap out of your view. And so you're kind of going back and forth. Does this second section allow you to keep the flap up to give you the access you need? Um, uh, my answer is, I think I actually, 
um, have tried to push the flap out of the way with the suction and um, it, it does work. I haven't had that many scenarios where I've needed to do that. I will make a general comment that to be able to really deftly use your left thumb to operate with two hands, it takes a little time. So I've done about two dozen of these cases now, and I'm just now at the point where I really feel like it's a natural left hand and I'm starting to do things like that. I, that particular maneuver you mentioned, I've only tried a few times with varying success, but I think um, in the future it'll be easier and easier. All right. So let's see, let's see what this feels like to try to put in a porp with this, uh, with this device. Like I said, this is my first time using it. The other thing I'm kind of thinking about as I do this is it does take some getting used to, to manipulate the suction and, you know, think about the, the, uh, the position of the tip of the camera and the tip of the suction as being two independent functions, you know? Kareem, could you bring the telescope uh, closer in so we can appreciate some of the sure. wide angle views of the anatomy? Yeah. Example, protein epitopinum. Yeah, and, and you know, I kind of see that if I want to look at more at the epitopinum, if I kind of rotate my hand uh, counterclockwise, I see more of it. Um, whereas if I, if I have the epitopinum at the left-hand side of my screen, I have a less wide view. And that's, you know, that, that again, goes back to the fact that it, it, uh, you, you have a 120 degree field of view if you uh, think about the angle of exposure from one corner to the diagonal corner. So let's take the rose and we'll point out some anatomy. Because the zendoscope is very small, um, you can get it into tighter spots better. So you could actually remove the suction port and you can get it into the epitympanum and look around with a narrower, you know, um, lumen than you would uh, with a typical at three millimeter wide endoscope, just purely because it's narrower. That really, really helps. Sure. So here we have the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. There's the uh, anterior edge of the round window, the tensor tympani. Here's our promontory again. I'll lift up on the malleus here, see if we can sneak a look at the uh, pro tympanum. So that shadow there is gonna be the uh, opening of the eustachian tube orifice. There's Jacobson's nerve coursing over the promontory. Again, posterior pillar of the round window, anterior pillar, round window niche. This is what's called the fustis. A lot of people consider this to be a nice um, pointer for the location of the scale of tympani. So that can be helpful when you're doing a cochlear implant looking for, um, you know, looking for the scale on a obliterated, obliterated round window, for example. Hypotympanic air cells, cells, in this case, we don't see the jugular bulb, but it's if it's high riding, often you can see it. Uh, uh, it can be dehiscent, or you can see the blue hue of the bulb through the bone. Let me re remove that suction port like Justin was uh, describing and see what kind of view we get without it. Can you comment on the weight of the device compared to a regular endoscope? Because that's something the viewers may not appreciate is how this thing weighs basically nothing. Oh, absolutely. And so earlier I was describing the, uh, the fatigue, the muscle fatigue that you get in your non-dominant hand holding the, uh, the scope for long periods of time. I can definitely see that that would be a non-issue with this scope. It's, it's you know, I, I don't know how much this thing weighs, but it, it feels incredibly light. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to do yeah. the, uh, the port placement because it uh, looks like it's already 1135. That flew by. Does anybody have uh, any questions or comments before we sign off? Can you comment on the picture quality? You know, this, this is not a 1080p or 4K video sensor. And so there's always going to be a compromise when you move to a distal chip system. Um, so I'm sure the viewers are probably interested to know. I mean, it is lightweight. Perhaps the form factor is, is, is different, maybe better for some, maybe worse for others, but what about the picture quality? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And I, admittedly, you know, with the uh, quality of our monitors uh, uh, here in the Temporal Bone Lab, I personally don't pick up on the difference as much, but I know that it does exist with this, uh, with this device. What, what's your, what are your thoughts about that, Dan and uh, Justin? 
I can comment. I mean, it's it's pretty close. I'll be totally honest. It's not quite the same as the stores one, but uh, overall, compared uh, to the traditional system, having the ability to use my hand to suction, having it be uh, more maneuverable, less fatigue, I, I prefer this. And I pretty much honestly exclusively switched to this now. I really like it. Oh, wow. I, I'm actually, I'm still getting better and better. I mean, every case I do, I suddenly realize, well, now I can hold counter tension to cut this band of adhesion because I have two hands and it's, uh, it's very, very nice. Someone asked a question about light source intensity. With this thing, the light source has no temperature elevation. I mean, you could you could put the tip of this, you know, on your on your cornea, it wouldn't hurt. It is it is not elevated at all. With traditional endoscopes, it depends what the light source is um, that you're using because it can be variable. And I think the general recommendation is to keep the light source as low as you possibly can to avoid thermal injury from the hot tip. Right. So th this tip doesn't get hot at all, does it? I, I've never even noticed a one degree temperature elevation with it. Hear me? Like I, I will readily put this right on the drape with the light on and not think about it. There's like zero chance of the drape catching fire. There's no temperature elevation. Very cool. Well, I think we should probably sign off. I want to make sure we kind of stay on time and uh, keep on going with the afternoon session. But I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you all so much for taking the time to contribute and uh, give us your thoughts and insights on endoscopic ear surgery. We'll keep going. Kareem, beautiful dissection. Congratulations. Really, really nice demonstration. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes, thank Dan. Thank you for the invitation, Absolutely. Kareem. Yeah, great. Yeah, right. thanks all. Thanks.